why using pulsed wave Doppler? For pulsed wave Doppler, the usage is quite clear. We need it for the continuity equation to calculate the aortic valve area. So we need to calculate the overall square centimeters to quantify aortic stenosis. There's a whole video about the aortic stenosis, almost an hour long, so click the box and check it out for more information. To have a quick overview, you see a lot of measurements over here. Here you see the aortic valve area with the VTI. You see the aortic valve area is 0.52 square centimeters, which is a severe or even critical aortic stenosis. If we index it, it was a very slim and small patient, we get an aortic valve area indexed to body surface area of 0.348 square centimeters per square meter, also an equivalent of severe or even critical aortic stenosis. When we take a look at the VTI of the LVOT, that's normal, about 20 centimeters approximately is normal. When we look at the stroke volume index of 52.42 milliliters per square meter, that also shows that there is no low flow situation present and the cardiac output and the cardiac index both are in the normal range. So you get a lot of information out of this measurement. The Continuous wave Doppler has to be measured across the aortic valve too, and also the LVOT to quantify all those measurements. But overall, you get a lot out of this measurement by only visually assessing it and then measuring it. Also for shunt calculation, for example, just to mention the QPQS, it can be helpful. LVOT obstruction, midventricular obstruction can be localized with pulse wave Doppler as well. Why continuous wave Doppler? Here is again the patient with a severe aortic stenosis. We do see the maximum velocity 6.2 meters per second, so definitely severe aortic stenosis. The mean pressure gradient, I just have to remind you that 40 millimeters of mercury mean pressure gradient resembles a severe aortic stenosis. This is above 100, even 106.19 millimeters of mercury when you measure this signal and that's severely elevated. So this is truly a critical aortic stenosis. So we need that for the quantification of aortic stenosis as well. The continuous wave Doppler can also be used to quantify aortic regurgitation by means of a measurement called the pressure half time. Here the continuous wave Doppler was used to quantify LVOT obstruction. This is a patient with hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. You can see the severely thickened hypertrophied left ventricle. You see the SAM phenomenon. And here with the continuous wave Doppler, there is a true LVOT obstruction of five meters present. LVOT obstruction and aortic stenosis are two different signals and of course two different disease entities. Aortic stenosis is a problem of the valve, calcification of the valve, and a narrowing of the actual outflow or the flow through the valve. The LVOT obstruction is something that is before the valve. It's a dynamic obstruction. You do see here the signal is, is more round shaped, the LVOT obstruction is more like a dagger shaped form. When it is truly in the LVOT, it looks a bit less steep at the beginning. When it's mid-ventricular, the curve is even steeper and it looks sharper. Here we have the measurement of aortic regurgitation. We can grade it with the pressure half time. You can measure it from here to here and you can get several measurements. It's not always that easy. You really have to have the aortic regurgitation in the continuous wave Doppler spectrum. If it is above 500 millisecond, it's most likely a mild regurgitation in between 5 to 200. It's moderate. And if it's shorter than 200 milliseconds, it's a hint that this could be severe aortic regurgitation. So if the curve is really steep, keep in mind, you need to have a really good curve. Otherwise, the measurement will be off. Now to get the coronary sinus view, we have to tilt the transducer the other way. So for the five chamber view, you tilt more cranially, so more upwards. And here you tilt more caudally towards the coronary sinus. And there you see the most basal parts, the basal inferior septum, the coronary sinus, and the most basal parts of the ventricle. And the coronary sinus view, it looks like this here you have a patient with an Epstein anomaly. You see the left ventricle, the right ventricle, the right atrium. And here the valve, which is very, inserts very high in the right ventricle. And here you have the coronary sinus or the venous structure, which leads into the right atrium. And here you have an additional structure. This could be a valvular TBC, so a very small valve of the coronary sinus, which is a remnant of early development of the heart. 
or it also could be Rete Chiari, but as there's only this small structure scene, it really could be the Barbula TBEC. So the coronary sinus view, when you have a large coronary sinus like this, you have an extra systole here, large coronary sinus. This is the patient who had a ruptured sinus of Alsarba. There is another pathology or anatomical variant. You can see a persistent vena left superior vena cava. Here you can see the coronary sinus. So young patients with a severe dilatation of the coronary sinus most likely have a persisting superior left vena cava. It can also be a hint of elevation of right atrial pressures. You can see the CRT lead sometimes quite nicely in the coronary sinus or a pacemaker lead in patients used for heart failure. You can also, if there is treatment happening of heart failure, you can see other devices such as a reducer or a carillon system and inferior infarctions you can also visualize in this area over here. By means of orientation, when we cut the ventricle through the four chamber view, we have both the right ventricle and the left ventricle in our field of view. When we tilt the transducer to the five chamber view, we get more like this orientation. And here we have the five chamber view. And we can also rotate the transducer from a four chamber view clockwise to achieve an atypical lateral view. So it looks like a five chamber view, but it just shows different parts of the left ventricular walls by means of rotation. Here you have the lateral parts of the left ventricle nicely displayed. Regional wall motion abnormalities in this area can only be seen in this view. You also get the glimpse of the LVOT and the aortic valve and you can quantify aortic regurgitation. And this sums up the lecture about the five chamber view, the coronary sinus view and the atypical lateral view.